Welcome to the second part of the session on monitoring and evaluation tools and methods. In the first part of this session, Monet introduced the three main frameworks for monitoring and evaluation, as well as the monitoring and evaluation cycle and stages. The second part aims to introduce you to monitoring and evaluation tools that can be customized to LTLD programs implementation. When we talk about monitoring and evaluation tools, we refer to the instruments that are used to measure what the monitoring and evaluation process aims to assess. Not all the tools work for the same purpose. Some of them will work better for monitoring processes, and some others will more appropriate for evaluation purposes. Let's start with some key questions to consider when in the second stage of the monitoring and evaluation cycle. Capture of data. First of all, it is crucial to know in advance what is what you aim to measure. The elements that help us answering these questions are called indicators. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, an indicator is a quantitative or qualitative factor or variable that provides a simple and reliable means to measure achievement to reflect the changes connected to an intervention or to help assess the performance of a development actor. The formulation of indicator must be smart, and I'm sure this is something that you have heard in a previous uh, training in this Learning to Live Together program, meaning that they need to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bounded. In the case of the LTLT program, the objectives that you set for your program in the design stage are the starting point to answer this first question. If you already know what that your aim for monitoring and evaluation is to measure the extent to which the objectives of your program have been fulfilled, then you can start considering the second question, which is what information you need to know. And here it is important to be aware that not all the information is useful or necessary. If your aim is to assess the achievement of program's objectives, then you might prefer to stick to it and think carefully about what is the kind of information that helps you to do so. It is also crucial to decide on how you plan to do it, including an assessment, not only in terms of the financial and human resources needed, but also in terms of the resources available. This will avoid you future delays and reporting issues. Another key question to address before gathering data is to think about the target group of your monitoring and evaluation process. In the case of the LTLT program, the ultimate beneficiaries of the programs are children. Therefore, the objectives you are expected to measure are those you set at the beginning of the program, a program designed to be implemented with children, meaning that the target group of your process is children who participate in the LTLT program. Only after you consider the previous questions, you can start about uh, thinking about what tools you plan to use, and also assess which tools are more appropriate for your goal and enemy the information you need to collect, the resources you have got, and the target group you are working with. The when is another key question in the process. As Monet previously mentioned, the monitoring evaluation cycle has different moments or stages. All of them are complementary processes and therefore need to be connected and consistent to each other. To this respect, a timeline is strongly recommended to track down the cycle and objectives for each stage of the monitoring and evaluation process. Do not be afraid to set deadlines. Just make sure that you are in the capacity to deliver within the time frame you are committed to. In a previous question, we suggest you to think about the human resources that you might need to conduct monitoring and evaluation. However, it is also important to consider where are the actual human resources available to support you. At this level, you should be realistic and transparent with the person or persons that is or are going to support you uh, and, and be clear about the fact that this is a shared responsibility towards the process. We are aware about the demanding uh, that such a process can be and this is why we recommend you to be realistic on your goals from the beginning of the process. And mentioned in the introduction of the monitoring and evaluation cycle, dissemination and utilization of um, the results is a key and paramount uh, aspect of this process. It actually it is paramount for the improvement of program's impact. And like an spiral, impact cannot be increased 
unless the best practices get replicated, the good experience get upgraded, and the bad ones are assessed, either to be improved or to be removed from the next cycle. In this sense, the best way to incorporate the monitoring and evaluation results of your programs is to take, an, is to take this uh, result into consideration for the design stage. Let's continue with something that is very, very important when conducting the monitoring and evaluation process, or in general, when working uh, with children. Many of these um, aspects you have already uh, experienced uh, in, in your own programs, but it's important to take into consideration, especially when conducting evaluation or monitoring. These are the uh, nine basic requirements for effective and ethical participation, a publication that is called Every Child Tries to be Heard, and it's a resource guide on the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, General Committee Number 12, which refers to the right uh, of children to be heard and taken into consideration in the decisions that, that uh, matter to them. And uh, I will briefly introduce you to what they are about and how they are applicable when you conduct monitoring and evaluation with children in the context of the LTLT program. The first thing is that the participation should be transparent and informative. And it means that even um, that children are aware that they are participating in the LTLT program implementation, it is important that they are aware also and informed about what, a, that, that what you are doing regarding monitoring and evaluation. You can briefly introduce them that you, they periodically will be part of a specific uh, exercises or activities that aim to improve their program, and uh, therefore this is why their participation is important and, and you want them to be informed about, about it. The second aspect is that the participation is voluntary. And it's, it's key uh, in the sense that children might agree to participate uh, in the LTLT program, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they do agree uh, in being part of a monitoring evaluation process. Although the process or the monitoring is part of the program, in that case you should inform them from the beginning that eventually they will be, their opinions will be taken into consideration as an input to improve program's impact. And then it's up to them and should be up to them uh, whether or not continue participating in the process. The third one is that participation is respectful. And this is something that you as facilitators have worked a lot about either in the training or also in the facilitation that you provide with children. So. It's, it's always important to, to, to apply it in, in all processes across the implementation, including monitoring and evaluation for sure. Um, and then the fourth is that participation is, needs to be relevant. It needs to be something that, that will be also meaningful for children themselves, for their own interest, expectations about the program. The fifth is that the participation should be child-friendly or generate child-friendly environments and working methods. And although the monitoring and evaluation uh, process can be, yes, creative and fun, and that's the idea about it, especially when working with children, it's important that the safe learning environment that you already create for the LTLT program stays for the other processes across the implementation, in this case for monitoring and evaluation as well, and making sure that the methods you use are in line with children's capacities, interests, ages. The sixth is that the participation needs to be inclusive, and it, uh, it's especially key when designing what kind of tools you're going to use. Uh, if you have certain groups that, for instance, uh, I don't know, I will put example of the picture you see on the right side of, of this slide, and this was taken in, an inter in, the, in the School of Intercultural Education in Greece, uh, with children who have been participating in this program for uh, during the last at least one and a half year. All of them come from different countries, and one of the main challenges that they have is that they don't have a common language, for instance. So when we were there actually trying to collect their voices, you can see on the floor like three uh, picture papers 
And basically, considering their limitations the communicate, to communicate in the same language, uh, we decided to address their opinions through drawing. And here, that's the sense in which, for instance, um, some of them, for instance, one of the groups shared, I asked them in that specific activity to draw in one side of the paper, they were splitting three groups. In one side of the paper, they were asked to draw about a situation or issue or the main issue that they faced before the program uh, was implemented as a group, as a course, as a grade. And then uh, one of the groups, for instance, uh, draw a lot of children uh, in black. And then on the other half of the page, I asked them to draw uh, whether or not, assess whether or not the situation or the issue um, has changed over the uh, months that they were participating in the program. And, and they, there were options, of course, like they could just say, you know what, it, it keeps the same, it's, it's, it, nothing has changed, or they could also express or represent what has actually changed. And this group, for instance, the ones that draw at the beginning, like all the children in black, in the second part of the exercise or the activity, they draw the same children in color. And when we asked them to introduce the meaning of this drawing, they said, this is what we were at the beginning of the process. We were here, uh, we were all diverse, but we didn't value our diversity. And this is what we are today. We know we are different. We know we, we, um, we, there are things that, that, that we don't necessarily agree on, but we appreciate and value our diversity and we feel proud of it. And this is uh, probably, if, if we would just go with writing, they wouldn't have felt as comfortable as we join, as they don't, uh, uh, not all of them uh, feel uh, comfortable with the local language because they come from very, like, at least 16 different countries. So this is important when, depending on the target group you are going to work with, make sure you are in your methodology and what you choose to go for is inclusive. The seven is that the participation should be supported by training. And it's a general rule for any participation process of working with children because the facilitators need to be trained to actually address uh, topics and monitor and evaluation processes with children. And this is what we aim to do through this online course and, of course, through the entire like uh, three uh, model training that the Arigato International offers on the Learning to Live Together program. The aim is that the participation should be safe and sensitive to risk. And it has a lot to do with the feedback, with, uh, with the previous points on being respectful and, and relevant and voluntary. But you need to be uh, or ensure that, that, that the environment, that you provide a safe learning environment for children, um, which is something that is key in general for the Learning to Live Together program implementation, but also be sensitive to risk, especially because uh, in monitoring evaluation, many times you have to address a before and an after. And the before is not always you know, nice to talk about. And people do not necessarily feel comfortable to talk about certain things or sensitive topics. And there it is your responsibility as facilitator to, to identify whether or not children are feeling comfortable about certain topics that you are touching uh, uh, upon, or whether this activity was, I don't know, if you are in certain context where physical contact is not, uh, is not very uh, comfortable or people do not feel very comfortable about it, don't uh, push uh, further than that, and and it, it's a lot to do. It has a lot to do with, with this sense of facilitation skills that you have also been uh, trained on. And the ninth point, um, it's it has a lot to do with the very first point of these requirements. The ninth is that the participation should be accountable, and accountable means that children do not only have the right to be informed about the processes they are involved into, but they also has a right to, to be aware 
about, about an access to what has been done with the information they have provided. And it has to do also with the other, like, previous eight points of these requirements. Uh, it's a matter of respect that children access to the information, that they know what the, what, what the information has been used for, and also uh, validate whether or not what they have said is what is reflected in, in the process. In the case of uh, the Learning to Live Together program and the way we expect you to consider these things, for instance, is that probably uh, after you inform children, like this is in, uh, just for you to know, every uh, once in a while we are going to have a particular activity that will address uh, your opinions or impressions about what we have done. Um, uh, but also, uh, once in a while, you will get the chance to see what are the results of that, what, what you guys have said uh, about whether you, whether you enjoyed or not the sessions, whether you enjoyed or not the methodologies, and then you will be informed also about how we suggest to improve this. Um, so it's very, very important to take this into consideration. Uh, before going through, okay, the selection of any particular method or tool. Then uh, we have the monitoring evaluation tools. Uh, there are several options out there, but that you also have the chance to, to check uh, out through the readings, the suggested readings for this week. But uh, there are a variety of quantitative and qualitative tools to run monitoring evaluation processes, uh, including at the level of quantitative surveys uh, that usually are re reflected through questionnaires. Um, and we're going to look at that in detail uh, later on. But there are also qualitative tools. And three of the main ways to address qualitative uh, research and uh, monitoring and evaluation goes through focus group discussions. And here it's also, it also entails the participatory tools and methods that uh, our guest expert, Claire O'Kane, will address uh, next week. Um, but it also um, covers semi-structured interviews that I would just like to briefly uh, sum up here, which is basically uh, the, the opportunity that you have, literally, you as facilitator uh, to with a child, for instance, but in that case, make sure that you are not alone with the child. Of course, this ethical part and protection uh, considerations are important, but then it's just uh, an interview that is that take place, a set of questions that take place between an interviewer and an interviewed, uh, and basically the reason why they are considered semi-structured is because although you have a s set of questions, and it might be, let's say, uh, four, five, uh, ten, uh, it gives space for, uh, like, adding new questions that can come up as a result of the contributions of the interviewed. So um, here, in many cases, it's sometimes necessary to do this way. Uh, but as you usually implement the LTLT program with a larger group than one person, uh, you probably would like or would prefer to use other options. Uh, however, set instructor interviews are very useful when you are working with one one uh, e approach, and here, for instance, you can conduct it with other stakeho stakeholders of the process. It can be the principal of the school, it can be other facilitators that have participated in the program, it can, either, it can be um, a, a parents uh, of the children you are working with in case you would like to, to get their impressions, opinions, uh, insights about about the impact of the program uh, on children. And there is a third qualitative that I would like to address, and it's a more significant change technique. Uh, it is also uh, explained in the suggested reading for this week. But let's focus first uh, this option of questionnaires for the quantitative uh, tool. Quantitative tool. <coughs> Are a set of questions, questionnaires are a set of questions that are given to people in order to collect their insights about a topic. They are considered quantitative as uh, they are meant to collect statistical information 
can be comparable due to the standard questions that are asked to different people that they do not necessarily know each other. They are considered a quantitative tool uh, due to this numerical aim that is behind a, a very like strict uh, process uh, of, of uh, standard questions. Uh, it's strongly suggested to, uh, to be used uh, for the collection, for instance, of demographic information uh, for baselines, and baselines are basically the assessment that we suggest, uh, for instance, before starting a program, it's just like checking up on children's uh, knowledge, skills, attitudes, uh, behaviors that, uh, that are, it should reflect that as, as a very like entry test. And, uh, this, and then uh, it should be applied or is recommended to be applied with the same children uh, once the program ends. And it is very, very useful uh, to actually follow a change and see what are the, what are the changes that can be actually attributed. Uh, it, it helps measuring what kind of changes can be attributed to the program itself because attribution is for sure one of the big challenges of these kind of, of social processes in which it doesn't necessarily mean that because they they attend the program, they, they have changed, the, the changes they, they uh, present uh, are only due to the program. Um, so basements are very useful at that level. It is also recommended to be used for to assess satisfaction rates, for instance. And here, uh, it's important to take into consideration what type of questions are involved in questionnaires. Uh, the questions can be closed-ended and open-ended questions. The open-ended questions are somehow easier because they are more flexible. It gives the space for participants just to express uh, or write their views about a specific question. But the closed-ended questions are kind of tricky and different. Why? Because um, they include, uh, for instance, uh, let's say multiple choice questions, they include yes or not, or also use the Likert scale. Likert scale is basically what uh, most of you use for uh, to measure satisfaction rate. But not all the time we actually apply it as it's supposed to be applied. Why? Because the Likert scale, which is the close-ended kind of question, are meant to be mutually exclusive. And it has two main characteristics. The first one is that the options or the values need to be symmetric. What do we mean by symmetric? It means that the same number of positive and negative options should be divided by a neutral value. In other words, as you can see in the image in the, in the, at the bottom of the slide, there is in the middle one, like, neutral face, happy face, which is not happy because it's neutral. And then we have uh, to the right, uh, from this neutral value, we have uh, two negatives, uh, faces. And then in, to the left side of, of this neutral value, we have two happy faces. So it needs to be symmetric in the sense that you cannot have three values or three negative values on the right and two positive values to the left. It needs to be either from the neutral point, the same number of values or, or kind of values in each side. The second characteristic of the Likert scale um, is that these uh, values need to be balanced. What, what does it mean to be balanced? that the distance between the positive and the negative values is the same. For example, agree versus disagree instead of agree versus strongly disagree. So if you see there are like the, the, the a typical liquor scale uses these values that you see on the screen. Let's start from the left when you have the strongly agree phase, then you have the phase agree then you have the neutral value, and then you go to the negative side, and it says disagree, and the last one is strongly disagree. So if you see, we have the two strongly disagrees on uh, the extremes of, 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 the, of the scale, and then we reduce the agree and disagree towards the center of the scale, and then we have the neutral point. So it's important to take this into consideration because many times 
you might just like have uh, or, or use other um, uh, values that are not necessarily symmetrical or, uh, or balanced. And then we have some golden rules for questions that apply for both, for instance, a, a, a open and close-ended questions. The first one, and among many others, is that the questions the questioner should address one question per item. You are not recommended to ask whether they do you like potatoes and strawberries. No, it's like you need to address one question per item. The clearer it gets and the more understandable wording you use, the most effective the questioner is. So take this into consideration the wording that you're going to use should be in uh, line with the target group you're working with. In this case, we're the learning to live together, which is children. Please make sure that you are using the appropriate and understandable and clear wording uh, that is in line and, and according to children's capacities, age, uh, etc., and cultural and context sensitiveness as well. Uh, the third recommendation is or advice is to use positive statements. Never go for negative statements. Use positive uh, statements when addressing the questions. And for sure, questions, formulations should not leave participants' answers. So please make sure that your questions are not addressing participants' answers. Otherwise, you are uh, threatening the, the objectivity of the results. Then we go to focus group discussions, and uh, this is very often used uh, uh, for, it, it, it is an qualitative tool, so for sure it's not focused on this numerical aspect, uh, because then in the, in, in the questionnaires, for instance, once you apply the questionnaires, for instance, the satisfaction rate, then you can say, okay, 60%, uh, 40%, 5 out of 10 participants felt comfortable about the methodology or liked the, the, the games used or uh, loved the content. Uh, but then in the focus group discussions, the assumptions or the, the results, the findings that you can get are kind of be, uh, and are not necessarily addressed through this numerical approach, but it goes further, it, especially through people's uh, views and personal experiences towards the program. And we have here um, uh, that, the, that the focus group discussions uh, are basically interactive and participatory, and there are like two main ways to approach it. Uh, one is uh, through discussion, and this is the typical approach to focus group discussion. Uh, and, uh, and the second one is uh, creative, through creative, creative expressions. And here uh, you can include a uh, role play, draw a ride, photo boys, maps, uh, that gives you the flexibility that you, that you need to address uh, the topics or the questions that you want to collect from participants. Uh, obviously, this is way more flexible than, uh, than questionnaires, but also have certain limitations because um, the tool uh, it can be sometimes biased and uh, in the sense that depends so much or relies so much on facilitator skill to, to give uh, the necessary outcomes of these, of these uh, focus group discussions uh, tools. In this sense, uh, the kind of facilitators' uh, skills that are key uh, when conducting focus group discussions are first to keep the focus on the topic. The role of the moderator there is to, you know, keep the attention of participants to the topic that they are aiming to discuss. However, at the same time, the moderator is not expected to lead the answers. So how to keep the focus on the topic without leading the answers? and at the same time trying to encourage participation. So many times we face these difficulties or these issues because we know, okay, I want to encourage participation and I just remind them the question, but at the same time they go through all their topics and they just start like getting apart from what I aim to aim them to reflect about. But at the same time, sometimes the questions or the comments I, I, I mentioned, trying to get them back to the topic, might be leading the answers of participants. And this is why your skills as facilitators are very, very important. But also, 
It has a lot to do with the kind of tools we use and how well they are designed. Here, the two pictures that you see on the right are focus group discussions that were conducted with facilitators of NTMT program, one group in Greece, another group in Portugal. And for, and, and for instance, here, the little like uh, things or color things that you see on the tables are actually little hands that included, for instance, at the moment we wanted to consult them about how uh, as, uh, familiarized they were with the key concepts, key values, and uh, if, if, uh, educational approach of the Learning to Live Together program. And then what we, we did was to um, cut these little hands and write on, on it each one, like key words about either a key value or a key concept or one element of the educational approach, and then just spread it on the room. And facilitators were asked just to walk around and pick the one that catch their attention. And then we did different rounds of it, and then they were sharing about, okay, what do you want to share about the, the hand that you pick uh, in, the, in the process? And here, this is a creative, um, a kind of creative expression approach to these focus group discussions, and that, were cost, that was customized to uh, be applied with adults, but uh, the most important thing about it, I would say, it's also to innovate, to see, of course, to, to look at what has been done and the kind of methodologies that work best uh, uh, at the level of focus group discussions, for instance, with children or the participatory tools that are offered out there, but also there to be innovative and to try out other ideas and to, based on your experience and expertise, there to share and, and, and try uh, new things as well. That goes, again, in line with children's capacities, and children's age, uh, and the group you are working with. So you are very much encouraged to innovate and to suggest as long as you fulfill the criteria that we already mentioned about, for instance, participation, that the tool that you are going to use is inclusive, that, um, that also uh, is addressing effectively the topics that you want them to discuss about. And here, for instance, this methodology or this activity with the hands, the hands already have the topic. Each hand has the topics or the elements of the topic that we want them to share about. So there was not much need for us as facilitator to address the conversation because the, we managed to actually design a tool that was able to address itself the discussion that we want them to, to, to participate in. So it's very important just to give yourself the opportunity to, to, to be innovative, to be creative, and, and just like keep in mind the key elements to consider. By the way, more of the participatory tools will be addressed next week. Um, but here I want to highlight uh, this technique, which is the most significant change technique, a technique that some of you are familiarized with. And I don't know for some others if you already had the chance to use it. But this is a very, very interesting approach and qualitative tool to monitor and evaluation, especially uh, focus on intermediate outcomes and impact. So this kind of technique, for instance, is more appropriate for evaluation rather than monitoring, although it can also be used for monitoring purposes. Uh, it's, I would say it's more effectively to be implemented for evaluation and intermediate outcomes and impact. In other cases, focus group discussions can be, some of them, like, be customized for monitoring, uh, depending on the time that they require or not, and some others uh, would be also more useful for evaluation. But in focus group discussions in general, it can be basically customized to, to both uh, parts. The questioners, for instance, on the other hand, they, uh, they are recommended uh, you can you can have, for instance, as if you have the demographic information, usually you can you collect it once throughout the program, and it can be, for instance, at the beginning of the program, and then if you have the um, the satisfaction rate, it's it's very very useful for monitoring, and and you can use it every session or every three sessions or uh, yeah or at the end or at the beginning at the end or three times throughout the program you decide. And baselines are for sure something that are like uh, work for at the beginning and at the end of the program. So 
depends on your needs and how much time you have got to actually uh, conduct certain activities and uh, monitoring activities, uh, you may decide, okay, what kind of uh, tools would be more appropriate for which kind of stage of the process. Then we have the most significant change technique, which is a qualitative tool, very participatory, and aims to look at the significant change stories from the field and a systematic selection of the most significant change story by panels. And it's interesting, and I would say the added value of this tool is that it allows all stakeholders, everybody involved in the process, to look at the level of impact. So it's it's an exercise that in, that brings everybody just to think at the overall goal of the program. In the case of the Learning to Live Together program, it is to equip children to make ethical decisions, to um, increase their capacity to nurture their spirituality, and also increase their capacity to develop their capacity to work together with others, with others to transform their communities. So it's it's a very interesting exercise that that helps children themselves and then all the other uh, levels of selection panels to look at the overall goal of the project. Um, so it's basically, as you already probably read in, in the suggested readings for this week, it's uh, about uh, asking the beneficiaries to share their significant change stories. And it can, it can be in several ways. It can be like writing a story, but there are also other forms of doing it, as for instance, video that you will also see next week. Um, and then, uh, or even draw, and then um, they are expected to share their, their significant change stories. And uh, there are a set of, of panel or selection panels that should be integrated at different levels of, of the organization. So we implemented this technique in, in the last year's monitoring and evaluation process conducted by Arigato International Geneva Office. And there were basically the, the significant stories that were collected with children. And then we had local panels that, that were integrated by facilitators that were working with the children. And at least one not related person or colleague uh, in the group of, of in the panel. It could be either, for instance, the principal of the school. It can be other facilitators that is not necessarily working with the group that you are working with. And then the local panel send their selection. And then uh, of, of uh, let's say, three or four more uh, uh, significant change stories. And then out of those or of that first election, a second panel took place, and it was composed, for instance, for Arigato International Geneva um, staff that selected other, let's say, two stories, and then it went up to uh, the the council, uh, the the interreligious council on ethics education, and they did another selection. So we had, for instance, you know, our exercise with this most significant change technique. We had, for instance, uh, three different uh, panels that work in the selection. And as I already mentioned, the focus is uh, rather um, than, than monitoring. It's for more useful, I would say, for evaluation. And there is also a certain limitation of this tool as it is not, uh, it doesn't need indicators to be implemented. So um, uh, as it doesn't have or doesn't need uh, indicators uh, to be used. Of course, it's, it relies a lot on the subjectivity of uh, the people involved in the selection. And we need to be aware that in many cases, for instance, if you use, uh, in regardless, if this, either there is, this is video or if this is, uh, let's say, writing, and especially our experience with children is that not necessarily the, the, what they write or what they say uh, on camera is exactly uh, or uh, embodies all of their experience. And this is challenging because in many cases you will you might find yourself be frustrated about you know what I know this this uh, boy or this girl had a really really I mean that would say that is that was the child who experienced the most significant change uh, in this program and it might be that his or her story is not selected in the next panel but but because the persons involved or the people involved in the next panel uh, did not see what you saw in the child 
and the child was not able to, or didn't feel comfortable enough or didn't know at the moment or did not remember to mention this or that uh, and, and, and his or her experience was not fully reflected in the story. So that is a limitation, but overall it's also a very good option, especially for evaluation or, or it's at, uh, to use it with, with children. Um, and having said all this, and I hope it's, it, it was... Now I would like to go through the assignments of this week. You have been asked to select only one monitoring evaluation tool that could be um, applied to the case study that you received in the very first week of the course. Uh, all you need to do as a group is to come up uh, with an agreement on what tool could be prioritized, either quantitative or qualitative tool you would like to prioritize um, to, to be applied uh, in your case study. Of course, we also encourage you to go through the suggested reading that you will find uh, in the platform. And please feel free to contact us in case you have any, any question. Thank you for listening to this session.